Hello, and welcome back to the Prentice Hall Biology Textbook. Today we'll be covering Chapter 17, The History of Life. Okay, 17-1, The Fossil Record. So, fossil and ancient life. So first, the scientists who study fossils are known as paleontologists, and paleontologists infer what past life forms were like. So all information collected about the past life is called the fossil record, and the fossil record provides evidence about the history of life on Earth, and it can also show how different groups of organisms, including species, have changed over time. Next, how fossils form. So the formation of a fossil depends on a precise combination of conditions. Most fossils form in sedimentary rock, and they start off with the decaying body is covered in sediment, and then the sediment hardens. And then when that happens, the remains stay intact and do not decay. So we get to see great fossils like the one over here. Okay, next, interpreting fossil evidence. Okay, so first, relative dating. So relative dating is the age of a the age of a fossil is determined by comparing its placement with that of other fossils in the layers of rock. So rock layers form in order of age, oldest on bottom, newest on top. And depending on where the fossil is found in the layers, we can usually infer what age it is. So index fossils are helpful in relative dating. And index fossils are fossils that are easily recognized ex and existed for a short period of time, but have a wide geographical range. So this means that they're found in only a few layers of rock, but they're found in many different geographic locations. Um, so relative dating then allows paleontologists to estimate a fossil's age compared with that of other fossils. And it does not provide information about its age in, year age in years. Next, we have radioactive dating. So scientists use radioactive de decay to assign absolute ages, or age in years, to rocks. So this is uh, done by measuring the radiation off rocks. Um, using the half-life, the time it takes for half of the element to decay, they can determine how much of an element has decayed and how long that's taken. So in radioactive dating, scientists can calculate the age of a sample based on the amount of remaining radioactive isotopes it contains. And the radioactive isotopes uh, scientists use are carbon-14 and carbon-12. Next, we have the geologic time scale. So, the geolo so we use divisions of d the geologic time scale to represent evolutionary line. And these times are used to mark where one segment of geologic time ends and the next begins. So the the first one is the Precambrian, which covers 88% of Earth's history. After the Precambrian time, the basis divisions of the geologic time scale are eras and periods. So eras divide the time between the Precambrian and the present into three, three eras. And there's the Paleozoic, which began 540 million years ago and lasted for 300 million years. Then there's the Mesozoic, which began 245 million years ago and lasted for 180 million years. And this is when dinosaurs and mammals first emerged. Then we have the Cenozoic, which began 65 million years ago and continues to the present. And this is known as the Age of Mammals. So the eras are then subdivided into many different periods. Okay, 17-2, Earth's Early History. So the formation of Earth. So the formation of Earth. So geological evidence shows that Earth is about 4.6 billion years old, and Earth formed from cosmic dust and different objects. So Earth's early atmosphere probably contained hydrogen cyanide, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, nitrogen, hydrogen sulfate, and water. And then about 4 billion years ago, Earth cooled down so that the first solid rocks could form on the surface. It used to be all uh, magma or lava. And then about 3.8 billion years ago, Earth's surface cooled enough for water to stay liquid instead of just as a gas. Okay, so the first organic materials. So to the experiments done by Miller and Urey suggested how mixtures of the organic compounds necessary for life could have arisen from the simple, simpler compounds present of a primitive Earth. Here off to the side, we can see the Miller and Urey's experiment. So to start off, we have boiling water, which produces steam, and then we have the gases found in, to, in the uh, atmosphere of the early Earth. And then these, when introduced with a spark and, a, and then condensed, uh, formed amino acids, which would be the very start to life on Earth. Okay, so the puzzle of life's origins. So the formation of microspheres. So under certain conditions, large organic molecules can form tiny bubbles called uh, protonoid microspheres. And they aren't cells, but they have some characteristics of living systems. They have selectively permeable membranes and simple means of storing and releasing energy. Next, we have the evolution of RNA and DNA.
So RNA sequences can help DNA replication, process mRNA, and uh, catalyze other chemical reactions. So this suggests that RNA was uh, existed before DNA. Then we have free oxygen. So microfossils are microscopic fossils, and microfossils of unicellular prokaryotic organisms that resemble bacteria have been found in rocks more than 3.5 billion years old. And so we know that these must have evolved in the absence of oxygen. So because the photosynthetic organisms produce mass amounts of oxygen, which is then released into the ocean and atmosphere, we can gather that the first organisms on Earth were photosynthetic. So the rise of oxygen drove some life forms to extinction, while allowed others to evolve. Uh, and then these new evolved formed more efficient metabolic pathways that used oxygen for respiration. Okay, now we have the origin of eukaryotic cells. So about 2 billion years ago, prokaryotic cells began uh, evolving internal membranes. And then this led to the endosymbiotic theory. So prokaryotic systems entered this uh, ancestral eukaryote. So the smaller prokaryotes began to live inside the larger cell. And over time, a symbiotic relationship formed. So one prokaryote had the ability to use oxygen to generate uh, ATP. And this became the mitochondria. And another, carried out photo another prokaryote carried out photosynthesis. And this became chloroplasts. So the endosymbiotic theory proposes that eukaryotic cells arose from living communi communities formed by prokaryotic organisms. So the evidence for this. So both mitochondria and chloroplasts contain DNA similar to bacterial DNA and it's separate DNA from the cell. So that suggests that they uh, were used to be different uh, organisms. And both have ribosomes whose size and structure closely resemble those of DNA. And both mitochondria and chloroplasts reproduce by binary fission. Okay, and then we have sexual reproduction and multicellularity. So this enabled evolution to advance uh, even further because of the shuffling of the genetic deck. And this also increased the number of the gene population. Okay, 17-3. Evolution of the multicellular life. Okay, first we have the Precambrian time. So during this time, simple anaerobic forms of life appeared and were followed by uh, photosynthetic forms. Next we have the multicellular forms that followed them, and life only existed in the sea. There was no land. Next is the Paleozoic era. So rich fossil evidence shows that early in the Paleozoic era, there was a diversity of marine life, and these were mainly invertebrates. And then during the Paleozoic era, there was the Cambrian period, which was the emergence of hard shells and outer skeletons. Next was the Ordovician and the Silurian periods, and this is when the ancestors of octopi and squid first appeared, and some anthropods became, became the first to live on land, and the uh, first vertebrates emerged, and they were fish. Next we have the Devonian period, and this is when some plants had adapted to drier areas, insects first appeared on land, and this is known as the Age of Fishes, and then during the Devonian, vertebrates be began to first uh, invade the land. Next we have the Carboniferous and the Permian period. So this is when reptiles evolved. And then at the end of the Paleozoic, there was a mass extinction, and 95% of all organisms died. However, the, both the fish and reptile uh, populations survived. Next we have the Mesozoic era. So events during the Mesozoic era include the increasing dominance of dinosaurs, and then the Mesozoic era is marked by the appearance of flowering plants. So first there was the Triassic period. So during the Triassic period, the main forms of life were fishes, insects, reptiles, and cone-shaped bearing plants. And during the Triassic, the first dinosaurs appeared 225 million years ago. Next we have the Jurassic period. So this is when dinosaurs became the dominant species. And there was the first bird, Archaeopteryx. Okay, next, the Crustaceous period. So this brought new forms of life, including leafy trees, shrubs, and small flowering plants. And then at the end of the Crustaceous, another mass extinction occurred, occurred, killing more than half of all plant and animal groups and all of the dinosaurs. Next, we have the Cenozoic era. So during the Cenozoic, mammals evolved adaptations that allowed them to live in various environments, on land, in water, and even in air. We have the uh, Tertiary Period. So this is when Earth's climates were generally warm and mild, and marine mammal mammals first evolved. Next we have the Quaternary Period. So this is when there was a series of ice ages, and mammals became uh, much more common after Earth uh, warmed up after the ice ages. And the humanoids uh, first appeared 200,000 years ago in Africa. Okay, 17-4. Patterns of Evolution. So. 
Macroevolution refers to large-scale evolutionary pattern and processes that occur over a long period of time. And the six important topics in macroevolution are extinction, adaptive radiation, convergent evolution, coevolution, punctuated equilibrium, and developmental genes and body plans. So extinction. Extinction has uh, more, when more than 99% of all species that have ever lived are now extinct. And this is due uh, a good amount to mass extinctions. When uh, mass extinctions wipe out entire ecosystems cl and collapse food webs. So see, species become extinct because their environment was collapsing around them, rather than they, uh, rather than because they were unable to compete uh, in nature. And so mass extinctions are caused by several factors: large volcanoes, continents moving, and sea levels changing. Next, we have adaptive radiation. So adaptive radiation is the process of a single species that has evolved through natural selection and other processes into diverse forms that live in many different ways. An example of this would be Darwin's finches. Next we have convergent evolution. So this is the process by which unrelated organisms come to resemble one another. And an example of this is how all aquatic mammals have streamlined shaped bodies. Next, coevolution. So coevolution is the process by which two species evolve in response to changes in each other over time. So an example of this would be flowers can only pollinate with certain pollinators. So their flowers evolve to attract the pollinators. Next we have punctuated equilibrium. So this is a pattern of long, stable periods interrupted by brief periods of uh, more rapid change. Next, we have de developmental genes and body plans. So this is change changes in genes for growth and differentiation during embryological development can produce transformations in body shape and size. And gene expression may cause many of the differences between chimpanzee brains and human brains. Okay, key concepts. So, what can be learned from the fossil record? Which type of dating provides an absolute age for a given fossil? Describe how this is done. How are eras and periods related? What substance probably, substances probably made up Earth's early atmosphere? And what molecules were the end products in Miller's and Miller and Urey's experiments? How did the addition of oxygen to the Earth's atmosphere affect life of that time? Where did life exist during the early Paleozo Paleozoic era? What evolutionary milestone involving animals occurred during the uh, Devonian period? What is macroevolution? Describe two patterns of macroevolution. Alright, that's it for chapter 17.